As science advances, researchers continue identifying genetic and neurological markers for the traits associated with the autism spectrum. Mental health researchers continue to debate whether physical causes can or should be included within autism diagnoses. Some argue that once a biological marker has been identified, the diagnosis becomes a medical condition. The American Psychiatric Association historically has removed medical diagnoses from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It is unfortunate that our healthcare system continues to arbitrarily separate mind and body. Supporting neurodiversity requires that we care for the mind and body, embracing a holistic approach to well-being. Welcome to Perspectives on Neurodiversity, a podcast dedicated to challenging myths and assumptions about neurodiverse life. I am your host, Christopher Scott Wyatt, speaking as the autistic me. Joining us for this episode of the podcast is Kirsten Fowler, the author of Family, Faith, and Fragile X, the raw story of a mother with three special needs children. Kirsten has had a love for writing since she was a young girl and has always kept a journal for expression, therapeutic value, and family history. Kirsten lives in a small Utah town with her husband, Jeremy, and their four children, three of whom do you have Fragile X Syndrome? I want to clarify that. Fragile X or Fragile X Syndrome, which is the preference? Um, You know, it kind of depends. The official name is Fragile X Syndrome, but we often just shorten it and say Fragile X. In my writing, I often just do FX or FXS. So it just kind of depends. But Fragile X Syndrome is the full name. Well, welcome to the podcast. And I'm sure we're going to learn quite a bit in the next half hour or more. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control has this very complicated definition of Fragile X. So according to the CDC, Fragile X syndrome is a genetic disorder. FXS is caused by changes in a gene called Fragile X messenger ribonucleic protein number one, FMR1. FMR1 usually makes a protein called FMRP that is needed for brain development. People who have FXS do not make this protein. Those with Fragile X associated disorders have changes in the FMR1 gene, but usually still make some of the protein. What in the world does that mean to somebody with the lived experience? It does get kind of complicated because, you know, it's with genetics and not everybody totally understands all the genetics. I usually describe it as basically you've got somebody that doesn't have that. It talks about the protein that they don't have and it makes it impossible. Well, I shouldn't say impossible, but difficult for them to access certain things in their brain, right? I like to think of it as... It is a lot like autism, but I like to differentiate it because of the genetic factor in it. Meaning when somebody has autism, they don't always know that genetic component. Whereas with Fragile X, there are carriers like myself and they are actually affected as well. So it's kind of a familial thing. Whereas a lot of times in genetic disabilities and things, the carriers don't have any, you know, they're not affected by it at all. Usually when I'm describing Fragile X and what it is, just to make it simple, I usually just say it is the most common form of inherited, at least the most common known form of inherited autism. And because a lot of people know what autism is, not very many people know what Fragile X is. There are certain physical characteristics with Fragile X, as well as a lot of behavioral issues with Fragile X. For example, Fragile X, they have a long face, large ears, and a prominent forehead. Some of the behavior issues, especially in boys, because boys are usually more severe, is that they have that aggression. There's a lot of cognitive delay as well. The reason why the boys are more affected is because it's it's on the X chromosome, which is why it's called fragile X. The the X is actually fragile. There's a little part of that X and that gene that's fragile. And that makes it so that they don't, they aren't able to do what, you know, the typical person is able to do. So I have a son and I have two daughters. So my two daughters are actually more high functioning because they have and they have two X's, right? So the girls have two X's, boys have X and Y. And so that's why the boys are more affected because they only have that one X to rely on. And the girls, they can have that 
second X that can kind of balance them out. So it gets kind of, <laughs> there's a lot <laughs> um, and it gets kind of complicated, but that's that's the best way I can kind of simplify it is just saying it's a genetic thing. It's It's related to autism. And when we look at the genetic markers, we see increasingly common screening methods for things like Fragile X for Rett syndrome. Yes. It's increasingly common for parents to get screened. Did you get screened before having children or after? Um, actually, I didn't get screened because I have two sisters that are older than me and they knew that they were carriers. And just because of the way the genetics work, we knew that my dad was a carrier. And then so all of the daughters, you know, were carriers as well. So I never actually got tested before I had kids. I already knew that I was a carrier. I didn't actually go through the testing. I have been through testing later on, just to find out how many uh, CGG repeats I have, which in the Fragile X world, that basically means if you have above 200 CGG repeats on a gene, that means you have a full mutation. If you have between, I believe it's between 80 and 200, you're a carrier and anything under that is your typical, you don't have Fragile X. I just got tested later to see how many repeats I have because that determines some of the severity of the issues you can have as a carrier and your likelihood of having kids with Fragile X. Did you discuss this as a family before having children? I talk about this a lot in my book. So I first discovered I was a carrier when I was 16 years old. It was hard for me, but I don't think I fully grasped the whole, like what it all meant for my life. I talk about in my book as well, how how hard it was to tell my future husband that, you know, I'm a carrier, our kids could have fragile X and all of those things. You know, we talked about it as a family when we first found out. And then later, my husband and I talked about it and about the future consequences of having children uh, naturally. Uh, we talked about, you know, should we do IVF? Should we adopt? Should we, you know, we weighed all of our options. And ultimately, we made the decision to go forward and have children on our own. And we had four and three of those four have Fragile X syndrome. And how does Fragile X affect you personally? Yeah. So as a carrier, I'm more predisposed to different autoimmune disorders, anxiety, depression, and I actually suffer from all of those. So I have I have anxiety, I have depression, I have lupus and fibromyalgia and Hashimoto's and <laughs> you know, all of these different things that I have to deal with as a family syndrome, you know, I have three kids to take care of and that changes my whole life as well. And I think there's certain things such as stress that further affect my mental and physical well-being. And so obviously having three children with fragile X syndrome has made an impact on my own mental and physical health. So it's a it's a big thing. You title the book Family Faith and Fragile X. So let's talk about that family aspect. Caring for yourself and caring for your children, how important is that family support network? Oh, it's so important. Um, that's one thing with Fragile X that I am glad. It's a family thing. So we all we all get it. We all understand it. And that's really nice to have. I mean, I have two sisters who are carriers and I have cousins and nieces and nephews that that have the syndrome. And so when we get together for family, you know, parties or get togethers, they all understand that if somebody, you know, if my son strips down naked or if I have to change a bum in public or, you know, any of these things that most people don't deal with, they just kind of get it and it's nice to feel accepted and understood in your own family. Because I think a lot of times, I know there's a lot of families, for example, who have children with autism and their family members don't understand that and they're not accepted in their own family. And that's unfortunate. And so having it be this genetic disability, it's hard because there's a lot of it, but it's also nice in the fact that we get a lot of support from one another because we understand it and we just get it. There is a larger Fragile X community beyond the family. Oh, yes. Yeah, for sure. I'm, a, I'm with a lot of different Facebook groups, which have been 
very helpful. Um, there's people all over the world that are carriers that are full mutation. And, you know, there's even some self advocates. There's some people who have the full mutation of fragile X syndrome, but they're very high functioning, especially girls, you know, they've gone to college and they have families of their own. So there's a large spectrum of fragile X out there. And we have a very, very tight community, which is very helpful to one another. How quickly did you recognize that your children who are diagnosed with fragile X were carriers? My first daughter didn't have it. And I don't know. I When I first saw her when she came into the world, I just knew. I was like, you know what? She, I don't think she has it. I don't know what it was. It's just something I kind of knew. And then with my second... I was kind of in denial. I can't describe it. They have kind of a different look when they are born, in my opinion. Obviously, they don't have the characteristics that are typical of fragile X because those don't come till puberty, such as the prominent forehead or a really long face. My son, he did have really big ears. So that was kind of a sign. And then when he was younger, when he was just, he's probably six months old, maybe only three months old. And we noticed that when you, when we put him on his stomach, he could lift up his head. And that's not normal. <laughs> but it was because these fragile X kids have a way of stiffening their muscles. And so it made it look like he was progressing quicker, but he was actually just stiffening his muscles. And they'll do that too when they're walking. You know, they may walk early, but it's because they're stiffening their knees and their legs. And so they're just kind of walking on stiff. So anyway, I kind of knew with my other children just by the look and by the feeling that I got as a mother, it's kind of a hard thing to describe, but it just happened that I just kind of knew as soon as I saw them. I, I just remember thinking, you know, I think they have fragile X. And then as soon as they are born, I have them do a blood test on my kids. And with Isaac, my oldest son, my only son, He's, his took four weeks. So I had to wait four weeks. And that was, he was my first. And so it was really hard to wait that four weeks. I was really nerve wracking and I was nervous and I wasn't really sure about it all. Cause you know, that first one is the one that really changes your life forever. Whereas the ones after that, you're like, well, my life has already changed. <laughs> so um, with my daughters, it took about two weeks after they were born to find out. And it's just through a simple blood test. And then the doctors would call me and say, okay, you know, your son or daughter has fragile X syndrome. And that first one was devastating, honestly. Um, even though I knew it was a possibility, it's just different when it actually happens. And you realize that things are going to be different in your life, that, you know, your child is not going to be able to do certain things or get out of the house or go to, you know, get married or, or different things like that. And obviously with Fragile X, we didn't actually know if that was how it would be. It's kind of, you know, it's like autism where they could be very high functioning. They could be married. They could, you know, do all these things. But I think at the time I was just so much in myself. And so I got in a deep depression and just, I, it was almost like, losing a child because you're I was losing all of the dreams that I had for that child at that time it was really difficult for me and as I got as time went on I realized that you know these are still my kids I love them for exactly who they are and they are the way they are for a reason and they're they're part of our family for a reason I've just come to accept it. I guess you could say I've gone through a grieving process with each of my kids and you have to come to a point where you accept their diagnosis and you accept what their life will be like, you know, and what your life is going to be like from there on out. What are some of the limitations that you see for the children that are unexpected or that other parents might not understand? Well, for my son, Isaac, like I said, he's more severe. He struggles a lot with aggression and with self-harm and all of these different things. And so from what I can see, he he can't ride a bike. He's still, he's nine years old. He's still not potty trained. He doesn't read or write. You know, there's a lot of things that he can't do, but I like to think of the things that he can do. And we focus on 
a lot of the small things that happen, things that other parents may take for granted, like, oh, he's finally saying I love you, you know, at nine years old, and he's finally getting water for himself. Like, I don't have to get it. He can get it from the fridge, you know, just these little things that other parents may not even blink an eye at, you know, it's just a natural thing. We celebrate those little things. As far as for my daughters, we are unsure what their future will be like because right now my daughter Eliza is in first grade. She's currently going to a regular first grade class with some added help. And we don't know what her future will be like. We don't know for sure what if she will have the opportunity to get married. We're, you know, because she's still so young. My girls are still so young. And even though they're more high functioning, I don't know what their capabilities will be as they get older. It's kind of something that you just kind of wait and see, you know, you just take it a day at a time and see what they can do and be happy for all the little things they can do and, and work on the things that they struggle with. I've noticed that parents have different reactions than some of the self-advocates in the neurodiverse communities and different concerns. When I speak to groups, parents always emphasize, will my child have friends? Will they have social relationships? Will they have future families? And a lot of the neurodiverse self-advocates are like, yeah, I don't care. You know, for the longest time, my daughter, my oldest, she was very happy sitting and reading. And only recently, only this school year, and she's now in fifth grade, did she start to make friends. Now she has a friend, but it's a major change because previously we'd ask her, do you want to go out and do something? No. You know, and she was happy sitting, reading by herself. Her diagnoses include enough things that we don't know what is at work here. There's enough things that we're like, oh, it could be anything. If she's happy being alone, then we just need to accept that. Now, for me, that's difficult because I know as an adult, the social connections I don't have are the very things that are necessary for social success and financial success, academic success. If you don't work with other people, if you're not interested in other people, you can't move ahead in a lot of ways in our society. Yeah, that's true. So uh, my concern is wanting her to socialize, and yet I perfectly well understand through my own experiences, yeah, I don't want to go to a party. I don't want to go to that school event. I have no interest in the assembly. Please don't make me play in a band with other people. You know, I'm more than happy playing keyboard or clarinet on my own, but gosh, I got to be in a band with other humans. It's kind of annoying. Yeah. How do you balance knowing your experiences and what your children, that they're individuals with your expectations, much like mine as a parent? Oh my gosh, she has to get in groups. I need her in to understand that without those groups, your future's limited. Right. Yeah. And that's hard as a parent because you definitely have these, well, yes, you have ac expectations, but then you also realize that your child is an individual and there's certain things that they like or don't like. And I think for us, a lot of times we just say, okay, you know what? They're happy and that's okay. You just have to be okay with that. As long as it's not going to intervene with something in the future that they may need. Because there's certain things that you know you have to push for, even though it's uncomfortable for your children, such as, you know, maybe those friendships and social things. Because like with my kids, they have a lot of anxiety. Um, one thing with Fragile X, though, is they actually want to be a part of that social. They want that social interaction, but they can't handle it because of their anxiety. And so we make sure to kind of push them just enough so that they're not overwhelmed so that they can kind of see, okay, I think I can do this. It's hard, but I'm doing it. And then it, you get kind of this balance where they're happy with what they've got. You're happy because they're trying. And, you know, I think it's just like this balance because obviously you can't make them do everything that you want to do. I know that as parents, sometimes we want certain things like, well, we want you to have this birthday party with all of these people because it's your birthday, you know? And when really they just want to chill by themselves on their birthday. And that's cool. Like birthdays around here in my house, very chill. Like <laughs> we just do, there's something here and that's okay because not a big deal if you want your birthday party they're at home, you know, like that's not going to really affect your future. But as far as social situations where we want them to improve, we want them to have these friends or know how to interact with other people in the world, because if they want to be accepted into the world and have jobs in the future, this is what you're going to have to do, right? And so 
I think it's a balance with realizing there's certain things that I want for my children, but what is really best for them? What can they handle and how can I help them? How can I scaffold them so that they're, they can reach that goal in a comfortable way that kind of pushes them, but not so much that it's puts them into a meltdown or, you know, so they'll never do it again. It's a hard balance. In our family, Anne is very happy with people. She will run up to people and hug. She wants to talk to everyone, but she is a hundred pounds, five foot tall, third grader. Wow. And it scares all of the other third graders. She is this outgoing, larger than life and very emotional. Mm -hmm. So when she does get rejected, she goes into complete meltdown. I'm lonely. Nobody likes me. And you can see, just like you said, that childhood depression kicks in where she wants to connect because of her neurodiversity. She can't connect easily. The other kids just don't know what to make of her. Mm -hmm. And so she's sitting alone crying. Oh, that's so, that's just heartbreaking as a parent. I know that watching my own kids for Isaac, it's different. He's in a special needs classroom. There's only a few kids in the whole class. You know, he's, he's more severe and he's okay being in his own little world. And my younger daughter is the one, for example, that's in first grade. She does want to make those friends. And um, I discussed with her teacher, her teacher is amazing this year. And, uh, you know, we decided that it would be okay to talk with the class while Eliza was out having a you know, a meltdown break, it would be okay to talk with the class and kind of help them understand what was going on. Because I think sometimes children don't understand and they, they get afraid because they don't know what's going on. And so if there's like a meltdown going on or anything like that, they're going to be like, oh, let's stay away from that person. You know, we had the teacher just talk with the class and say, you know, this is Eliza, she's she's different than maybe how you are, and that's okay. And you know, and just kind of described it in a nice way that the children could understand. And from that point on, the children were more understanding and they were more kind and they were more accepting of her. And when she had her meltdowns or different things in class, they wouldn't stare at her or be scared of her. I think that's hard because oftentimes, you know, even as a parent, I debated like, I don't know if I want the class to know or make it this big announcement because I want her to just be like everybody else. The truth is that they're, they are different and that's okay. But the other kids have to understand what that means and they have to understand how to treat them. The other side of that coin is I want my children to be accepted for who they are and to actually have real friends and not just friends that are being nice to them. It's kind of a, a give and take and we're we're just trying to navigate it. Honestly, we're, we're trying to navigate this with my daughter just to see what's best for her and how we can help her in, in her classroom. We are working with the idea of self-advocacy, disclosure. Lee has scoliosis and is now wearing a back brace. We had to work with introducing her to the school nurse, having her meet the nurse. And we went to the nurse together. We talked about where she could put the brace when she wants to do PE. This is a big step for you know, someone who's in fifth grade learning to say, I have a special need, you know, that I'll need to take care of during school. That is a huge responsibility. And then you add on to that, that she is neurodiverse. And so it becomes even more awkward. She doesn't want to draw attention to herself and be noticed in a negative way. So it's very hard to teach a child who's our children when they were five, six years old, they knew that they were different. They could tell. Yeah. So how do you address that balance of telling them, okay, here's how to, here's who you are and what you are, and you can decide, or we can decide if your friends should know. I know you mentioned that your daughter's only in first grade, but that's certainly something now that we've reached the point of thinking that maybe fifth grade's a good time to, okay, if you want to tell your friends and talk to them and explain to them, now's a good time. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, like you said, it, it's different for each individual and it's different for each child because they're all so very different. Um, their needs are different. And I think that's really wonderful that you have encouraged your daughter to to do that because, and it, you know, it is hard. Um, I know for me, I have anxiety. And so, yeah, I don't want to be like, hi, I have anxiety. Like that just makes it worse, right? It's really difficult for these kids to, ex to not only accept what they have, but also to say, hey, this is what I have. This is what I need. When they're so anxious or when they have these other disabilities, it makes it 
even more difficult for those individuals. In your book blurb that I read, it says that you connect with your children through music. How important is music to you and your family? Oh my goodness, Kay. <laughs> I love music. I grew up with music. My mom, my mom actually grew up with 13 siblings, 15, but two of them passed. And they had a, a family band. And, you know, just for generations, we've just loved music. And so with my kids, I have been that love as well. And, you know, my oldest daughter, she doesn't have Fragile X, but we have her in all kinds of choirs and plays and, you know, different things. And then with my other kids, we sing songs every night and we were part of a certain religion and we like to sing those religious songs that help us. And it, it calms my kids down when they're having a hard time. And there is just a certain, you know, I talk about family history. I'm, I'm a big advocate of that. And, when my mom will come over to visit, she'll, you know, we'll get out the guitar and she'll sing songs that she wrote and the kids love it. And they'll just dance around our living room. And it's a special way that, that they can all connect. It's almost like this other language that you don't need words. You don't need to know all of these algorithms. You can just enjoy music and be happy and we can all connect with one another. And I really love that. So that's one thing as a family that we enjoy doing together is listening to music, taking a little dance break in the middle of the day when we're having a hard time and just really enjoying that time with one another and just listening to the music. You don't have to talk. You don't have to, you know, you just enjoy the flow of the music and dance with one another. It's, it's, it's easy and it's fun. We just love it. The other part of the title, their family faith and fragile X Quite a few of the guests on the podcast are people of faith. And you just mentioned that you are and that you sing the songs with your children and you're active in your faith. Yes. How does that help you understand and accept this journey of being a special needs individual with special needs children? Yeah, my faith is a huge part. I remember when I was first writing my book, I thought, well, I want to make it, you know, so that everybody can read it. And I was trying to kind of make it general. And I thought, nope, I can't take my faith out of this. <laughs> like, this is my life. This is how I get through it. I really don't know how other individuals go through life, you know, especially with special needs kids without knowing that there's kind of a higher power in control. Because I feel like with me, my personal beliefs are that each of us are special to our Heavenly Father. I'm a Christian. And I think that, you know, these kids that some people may, well, this is getting into an, another thing, but some people may not want them, you know, and they, they find out if they have fragile X and they abort them before they're even born. And I believe that these individuals, if they are worthy of life now, like these people living on the earth, these adults, well, then the people in your in the womb are just as worthy of life. And that kind of ties in with my religious beliefs. And my religion has really been the basis of how I get through so many things. Um, as a Christian, I really rely on my Savior, Jesus Christ, because I feel like He, through Him, I am strengthened to do more than I can alone as a carrier with a lot of mental and physical health issues, trying to raise three of these kids with their own special needs, it seems impossible. And so I feel like I have been extremely blessed through various means just to, to be able to take care of them and to take care of myself. And I feel like having a perspective where I know that, you know what, there's more to life than just this life. And I believe that after this life, my children will be perfect. And I can look forward to the time when I can speak with my son and, you know, talk to him like I would anyone else and how special that will be. And so it has, it gives me hope. My religion gives me hope and it gives me perspective so that on hard days, I can say, you know what, there is a reason why I was given these, you know, challenges and why I'm going through these things at this time. There's a reason why my children are my children. And I don't know, it's it's what gets me through every day, just knowing that there's a God that knows me and loves me and it knows exactly what I'm going through, even when it's so hard. 
that I can get through it because he knows me and he'll help me through. When did you start writing this and how did it end up being what it is? Yeah. So I actually, I've been wanting to write a book for a long time. Um, Like I mentioned in my bio, I, you know, I've always loved writing, but it was 2021. So it was just last year that I decided I'm going to do this. So I sat down and I got some things put in order and within 30 days, I made a 30 day goal. Within 30 days, I wrote my rough draft of my book. And it was the rough draft is a skeleton of what you know, what is right now. I just remember thinking, you know, my story, I feel like my story needs to get out there. And because when I would talk to people and tell them my experiences and what my day to day life was like, they would just sit there and like, what? this is what you deal with every day, you know, like some people would say, well, you know, on my worst days, that's, (laughs) that's your every day. And just some of the stuff that I deal with. And I realized that my life wasn't so much normal. And so like, oh, maybe I could write a book about this because people are so surprised by the stuff that I go through every day. But I think mostly the reason why I wrote it was so that people can see the reality behind what it's like to be a parent of special needs children and find not only somebody that has walked that same road so that they don't feel so alone, but so that they can find hope to see that somebody else is doing it and they're still happy and enjoying their life. And I want people to to see that. And so that's the biggest reason why I wrote the book. And, and right now, the thing that I love the most is when people come back to me and say, oh my goodness, I feel so seen, whether it was somebody that has fragile X or has kids with disabilities or just a mother that just said, I have been there. Thank you so much for writing this. I feel like you see me and I feel like I'm not alone. Like that just makes everything worth it. My wife and I are a team and the girls have noticed. They used to even call me mommy, daddy. (laughs) I was taking them to the bus stop. I do the doctor's appointments. Sometimes there was a point where my, my wife had some medical issues and I took care of the kids. When she's gone on business trips, I take care of the kids. And for the last, well, for two years, I was the homeschooling teacher. How important is that teamwork to dealing with being a special needs parent, yourself with Fragile X? How important is that spouse who is just rock solid in your life? Oh, so, so important. I can't, <laughs> can't emphasize that enough. I don't know where I would be without my husband because yes, we are a team in every sense of the word. And one thing that I put in my book is a there's a few excerpts from my husband because I feel like a lot of times the dad's point of view isn't as well known. And so I wanted to make sure that that was in there. And he, you know, he tells his side of the story and the good and the bad. And without him, I don't know where I would be because we do everything as a team. I think even more so than a lot of the typical parents out there, we have to work together. Like it's not even a choice. If, you know, if he's not there helping me, then I cannot do it. You know, I cannot do it alone. You know, it's similar when I am taking time for myself or when I have to go, you know, do other things. He's there. He's there taking care of the kids. He's helping them to get on the bus. And we discuss how we want to raise them and discipline them and what we want for their futures. With special needs, you have to plan for the future. You have to realize, okay, when I'm gone, where are my kids going to go? What's going to happen to them? That's something that me and my husband are on the same page. He really is the rock in my life because when I am down, because you know I have struggles of my own, obviously, and he is just the kindest and is always there to help support me and say, you know what, everything's going to be okay. Like you are an amazing mother. You are, you know, and he just like buoys me up and. He is just such an important figure in my children's lives as well. They really look up to him and he he's the fun dad. You know, I I can't do a lot of things physically just because of my help. And so he's always the one jumping on the tramp and, you know, doing all the fun stuff. So he's the cool, he's the cool parent, which I'm okay with. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just, I'm so grateful for my husband. I can't say enough about him. He's just amazing. And the fact that through everything, through my issues and with all the stuff we've been through with our kids that he has chosen to stick around because not everybody does. And I, I know a lot of others who have lost their, you know, where their husbands have gotten divorced from them because of the issues that they face. 
I am just so very grateful that my husband has chosen to, you know, step up and be there for me and for my kids. It's such a blessing. I really thank you for joining us. We've been talking with Kirsten Fowler. You can go to kirstenfowler.com. The book is Family, Faith, and Fragile X, The Raw Story of a Mother with Three Special Needs Children. I want to thank you, Kirsten, for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It was great talking with you. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed this episode of Perspectives on Neurodiversity. Remember to subscribe to the podcast and please leave a review if you found the discussion useful. I am Christopher Scott Wyatt speaking as the autistic me. And again, Kirsten Fowler, it was a pleasure to speak with you. You as well. Thank you.